Well, everybody sort of knows everybody, as it turns out. Uh, but what I'm going to do is say that I I was watching something on Mama Needs Love, which is one of uh, the million Facebook groups I'm in. And I saw April, and I was like, oh, my God, she has such important information to share. I'm an adoption attorney, but as an adoption attorney, I am not a criminal attorney. And it was this whole area that I didn't know about and what I should do to prepare my son. And so I asked April to present. So I'm going to turn the floor over to April so that she can let us know uh, what we should know. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking out time on your Saturday to hang out with us. Like she said, my name is April Prayer. I actually know Joel, and I've been an attorney for 21 years. I started off as a public defender, and I've been in private practice the last 14, 15 years. And recently, like in the last year, year and a half, I got really fed up with just representing one person at a time because it seemed like no matter what result I got for that person, they went back to the same situation and then there would be 10 or 15 people to take their place. So I actually developed a board game to teach teens how to interact with police safely, how to make it home safely, and how to avoid ever needing my services. And so because of that, I've gotten some media attention recently I have also launched an online course, which you'll hear more about, a five-week course for teenagers in order to learn um, not only what their rights are, it's one thing to know your rights, you can read all the law books, but if you don't have the courage or confidence to assert your rights, it's kind of all, you know, all a waste of time. So I'm going to just dive in and tell you the three major mistakes that I see parents make, because I think that in order to figure out where you're going, you kind of need to know what things look like right now. You know, need to know what the status quo is right now. All right, so the topic of today is what should I tell my kids about police? And I know that we have parents on here with children of all different ages. So my question to you is what if I could activate your teen superpowers? If you could put them in a position where they could tap into their critical thinking, their observation, their courage, their communication skills, because a lot of times kids know some of the rules, but then they can't communicate or express themselves to police officers. And what if I taught them to be leaders so that they could be the one in their peer group who everyone looked to when trouble is brewing to say, no, I think we should go in the opposite direction. So my question is, if I could do those things, would you want to know more? Yes, yes, I can see you all raise your hands. Yes, yes. Okay, so what I do is I teach teens to shift the power from the police officers to themselves because I am a firm believer after reading thousands of police reports, doing thousands of hearings and trials and representing thousands of clients that you possess the power, meaning the arrestee, the person who's detained on the street possesses the power to turn that situation around. We always wanna say that the police officer, yes, they have the gun and the badge, but they do not have all the power and you can control the outcome. So, but again, like I said, let's first look at the problem. The problem is this, 30% of black males, 26% of Hispanic males, 22% of white males will have been arrested by their 18th birthday. For, for girls, the numbers don't change much, doesn't really matter what your race is, it's about 12%. But this is the problem. Before they hit 23, so think about before they hit their, their college graduation, before they go out into the, to the world and into the workforce, that number jumps to almost half for Black males. Half of Black males will have been arrested by their 23rd birthday. And the major problem with that is if that arrest turns into a conviction, of course it can turn into a dismissal, of course it can turn into a deferred prosecution, but if it turns into a, a conviction, according to the American Bar Association, that means that there are 45,000, I mean, I can't even wrap my head around that, 45,000 collateral consequences. It can affect your housing, it can affect, you know, if you become a parent, your ability to go to school and, and volunteer with the PTA, it can uh, and affect your ability to work in different fields. It can affect your ability to get simple things like a barber's license and in some states voting, but obviously that's, that's changing. So there are huge consequences simply by having a conviction whether you ever serve a day in prison or not. This statistic I actually che checked right before we got on the call, it has changed. So in the last 365 days, 1,020 people have been shot and killed by the police. This is at the forefront of a lot of our minds. Everybody watches the news. They see the Black Lives Matter protesters. They seen the protests since George Floyd was killed. And what Joel and I both know is that the only thing new is the cameras. 
that the killings have been consistently the same for at least the last 10 years. It's about a thousand people are killed every 365 days. And like clockwork, about 25% of those are black. This is the problematic part. Black Americans are killed at twice the rate as white Americans. And according to the FBI, black Americans are arrested at 2.2 times white Americans. So I know a lot of parents are like, yeah, I really sympathize with support with the protesters. You know, I see my kid out there, but I don't want my baby to end up a statistic. I don't want them to be the next hashtag. And so because of that, I really wanna dive in and take a look at the three biggest mistakes that I believe parents are making with their kids, whether their kids are eight or 18, and obviously tweaks that we can make as a result of that. So number one is giving the talk. So a lot of times when kids turn 15 and get their driver's permit or 16 and actually start driving with a license, they sit them down and they have this stern talking to at the kitchen table. And the problem is the parents don't really know what to say. And oftentimes what they say is the wrong thing. They say things like, oh baby, just tell the truth knowing full well they don't know what the truth is. They don't know a lot of times what their kids are up to. They don't know a lot of times all of their kids' friends, even if they believe they do. And even if they know their kids' friends, they don't know all that their kids' friends are up to. You'd be amazed at how many times parents come into my office and say, oh, it's all a big misunderstanding. And they didn't know that their kid was the school drug dealer. They didn't know that their kid was the one who was selling ecstasy pills at 12 or 13. They didn't know that their kid was the one who was riding around with a gun in their backpack. But parents sit down and say things like, just, just tell them the truth, meaning the police officers, or just cooperate. And kids think that, well, you know, I can just go home if I just say what happened. And that's not actually the case. So giving the talk and not really having any... Um, idea of what to say and what not to say is problematic. Parents say things like just cooperate. I say comply, but don't consent. So comply means if it involves the police officer's safety, do it. So if he's telling you put your hands up, that means he wants to see your hands so you have no weapons. If he's telling your child, put your hands at 10 and two, put your hands at 10 and two, exit the vehicle. It's all about him being able to see hands so that his safety is in the forefront. However, if he's saying anything like, I'm going to search your book bag, can I search your car, can I search your trunk, the answer is no, I do not consent. Now, the cop will likely still search these places, and you are not to fight in order to stop him from searching these places, but in this world where everybody has one of these shiny devices in their hand, or there's a a camera on the local business, or there's a camera on the corner, or there's a camera on the cop's chest, it can it can really serve your child well to say do I do not consent because that can be an issue they win in court. So comply but don't consent. The, ne the next biggest mistake that um, adults make that parents make is treating the police station like it's the principal's office. So I can't see everybody's face, but I'm guessing everybody on here, you know, grew up in the 90s or the 80s. And if you got into a little scuffle and you pulled the girl's hair on the playground, you ended up in the, in the principal's office, everybody got a stern talking to and maybe at the worst you got detention or God forbid you got suspended. That was a really big big deal now. Well, now those same little scuffles and fights will land you in juvenile hall or in the Audi home or in the juvenile justice system. And you may very well be charged, your child may be charged with a crime because there are so many police officers now in the schools. So what would have been a simple matter, a fight, a scuffle, um, an argument about a cell phone or a, a post on Snapchat can now get really blown up. And the problem is parents are acting the same as it was when they were kids. Again, they're teaching them, just tell them anything, just tell them, just tell them the truth. Or worse, they're saying, oh, just tell them that I'm on my way. They can't talk to you without me being present. That is actually false. In Illinois, as in most states, the police can talk to your child whether you're present or not. They can actually appoint someone called a juvenile officer. That person will basically stand in as the adult, as the parent, and they will grill your child. So think about it. Your 15-year-old kid is getting grilled by a 30-year-old veteran, I mean, a 30-year veteran detective 
they don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. And they can tell the truth over and over and over again. And their words can be twisted and manipulated. And eventually, if I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Central Park Five or familiar with the movie When They See Us, all of those kids were sitting next to a parent when they got sold down the river, when they all gave false confessions. Four of the five had grandma, dad, mom, sister, all sitting right next to them as they as they gave themselves up and got their stories fed to them by police officers. So stop saying that because instead you should teach your child to say, I want an attorney. Cook County is the only attorney in, uh, is the only county in the world where an attorney will be appointed to you at the police station. You simply have to ask. Now there's some fighting going on right now with making sure that this is actually implemented in all the police stations, but in theory, all your child has to do is ask. And at that point, they need to say nothing else. And again, I don't care if your child is eight or 18, they need to say nothing until they have a conversation with their attorney. A parents always wanna walk in, this is a big misunderstanding, let's just explain it away. And explaining it away oftentimes ends your, lands your child in more trouble because you tell them things like, baby, just tell the truth, just tell them what you did so we can go home. And there's no guarantee that what they did was not a criminal act. You don't know what they did because they were not in your company. And they may very well uh, end up not going home with you just because they told the truth. And like I said, the cops absolutely can talk to them if you're not present. All that's required by law is that the police notify you as a parent of where your child is. But is that notification going to come eight minutes after they pick them up in seventh period class? Or is it gonna come eight hours after they've been grilling them by themselves at the police station? So what I tell kids and adults is shut up, lawyer up. And that is your best protection because one, in calling for an attorney, that attorney, and people don't know this, becomes your witness. So I actually had a situation where a friend of mine couldn't get to the police station. He sent me in instead. I got there and my client was 14 years old. Parents had been there two hours and not been allowed to see their child. I get there, I'm there another hour. They won't let, allow me to see him. And that's because they were beating him up in the elevator. They made sure to beat him about his body and not his face so that the bruises weren't immediately, uh, immediately uh, visible. I told the parents, the kid looked sh shaken up take him to the hospital. Turns out he was beaten. They ended up um, suing the cops and the cops involved were indicted because it was all captured on video in the elevator and the police thought the elevator camera was broken. So I, I say all that to say, I ended up being a witness to say, I got there at 1102. I spoke to these three people. They wouldn't give me access to my client. And then that becomes... Um, a benefit to you because I become the most valuable witness that you have who has believed even more over the police officers. So this is the third mistake is being reactive instead of proactive. So daily, I see parents who are absolutely blindsided when their kid gets arrested for something serious. Maybe it's a misdemeanor case and then the parent has to shell out 1,500 or 3,500 or maybe it's a serious felony case, which is what I see more and more often. And then you're shelling out way closer to $10,000 or more. If there's a federal case, you can forget about it. It's gonna be 15,000 or more. And so most parents obviously haven't set aside a fund just to get their kids out of jail, either with bail. Now during COVID, um, if they are, say older teens, like 18, 19, they're likely to get an I bond or EM, um, meaning they get a bracelet on their leg and they're able to be on house arrest. But oftentimes if it's a crime involving a gun, if it's a crime that is more serious, they're not going to have a bond that most parents can afford to pay. And so, and even if they can, they may not have this money liquid and be able to just drag it out in a couple hours to, drop on a bond. And on the top of that, then you also have to pay attorney's fees. Some attorneys will accept the bond towards their, towards their fees, others will not. So it becomes quite the blow. And parents don't factor in the heartache. You know, the financial commitment is one part or the financial hardship is one part, but sleepless nights, worrying about your kid, worrying about you missing work, them missing school, the financial stress, et cetera, et cetera, the embarrassment of your child being mixed up in this mess, the depression that your child may suffer, um, the aggravation of the entire thing. And so being proactive looks like giving your son or daughter a roadmap. 
because most parents, like I told you, don't have a plan, don't have a roadmap, don't know what to say. They wish the best for their child. So at best, maybe they talk to their police officer friend who's just going to tell them again, oh, just tell your kid to do whatever the cop says. But doing whatever the cop says usually means turning over and waiving your child's rights completely. So I'll tell you this story um, of two boys who were similarly situated. One I'll call one Spencer and one Kareem. So Spencer was a straight A student. He was a great kid, the type who would be class president, honor society, very well um, liked, very handsome, just really great kid. He was walking to the store, walked a friend to the store on the way back, dropped her off and was walking through the alley. Cop says, hey kid, come here. He's doing absolutely nothing. They had not received a call about him. They called him over, pat him down and find a gun. Spencer's parents had no idea he had a gun. He carried a gun for protection because oftentimes the good kids are the targets for the gangs. And he, uh, neither his dad or mom had any idea he had a gun. But Spencer was smart. He said nothing on scene. He did not know the law. He did not know his rights, but he knew that something was probably wrong about the way the police stopped him and, sh and searched him for no reason. Spencer actually ended up being my best client ever in terms of testifying on the stand. He was smart. He could communicate. He could, he knew directions. He was able to describe in detail what happened to him. And the cop really wasn't. The cop was a professional witness, but he was inarticulate. He didn't present well. He couldn't explain why he stopped this kid for no reason. And we won the case. On the flip side, there's Kareem. Kareem was also a handsome, good kid, uh, walking down the street, two loving parents, but when the police say, hey, kid, come here to search him, Kareem takes off running. He takes off running, jumping fences, hiding behind garages. And instead of the two cops chasing him, there end up being about 10 cops chasing him. And rather than tackle him to the ground and just take him into custody, they shoot him in his back. The, the bullet lodges in his spine. And now he is paralyzed. Now, exact same situation very different results. But this is what I mean when I say that your kid can control the outcome. I think that kid was 17. The first kid was 15. So your kid can control the outcome based on their reaction when stopped by police. And now the second kid, Kareem, is a paraplegic. He lives with his parents. He has a catheter. I mean, it's an awful situation. And he ended up getting probation really mostly out of sympathy because the judge said, there's nothing more I can do to you than that has already been done to you. But I offer two solutions for this. One, like I mentioned, I have a five-week intensive online course that I rolled out. And like I said, if your kid knows all the rules, they've studied all the law books that are behind Michelle in that lovely picture there, it doesn't matter if they don't have the confidence or they don't have the communication skills, they don't know that they have the power to turn the situation around. Because what's happening now, because of all the protests, because, and a, and a lot of young kids are participating in the protests, is because of all of that and because it's in the forefront, uh, there's a lot of hopelessness that teens and kids and um, young adults feel. They feel like it doesn't matter what I do, I'm gonna get arrested. It doesn't matter what I do, the police are gonna hurt me or kill me. I've heard them say that verbatim, which is frightening. And so what you do is put them in a position where they realize their inherent ability their inherent power to control the situation and turn it around. And then you pair that with their actual knowledge of the rights and they become their rights and they become unstoppable. Uh oh. So the other thing that I add is police proofing, proofing plan. So like I mentioned, it's likely that one in two um, black boys at the very least will be arrested by the age of 23. And so what does that mean? It means that parents need to be prepared if that happens. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to prison. It doesn't mean he's going to get a conviction, but it does mean that he'll have that police contact. He will be detained. And just as he knows what needs to know what to do, you need to know how to plan for that. So like I mentioned, in Cook County, police officers come to the police station for free. But if your kid doesn't know that, doesn't know to ask for it, 
doesn't know that they should be asking for a lawyer, then again, it doesn't matter. And if the parent doesn't know what to do next, because there is some confusion when someone gets arrested. One, you have to find out where they are. Two, you have to find out if they're at the police station. Are they still in, are they still in transit? Have they been processed yet? What are they being charged with? And you're trying to gather this information from their friends, from any witnesses on the street. Your kid is not likely to get a phone call to tell you any of that. And you need to prepare your child for all of this and the parent needs to be prepared as well. And so I throw on a police proofing planning session and that actually includes if you're in the Chicagoland area, me or someone from my office coming to represent your kid at a police station um, in the Chicagoland area. So the question is, what is your kid's safety worth? And you know, everybody I know is gonna say their kid is priceless. So I asked a few friends of mine to chime in about what they thought of me, my skills, and my um, my coaching and teaching ability. So this is Sam Adam Jr. A lot of you know his face is on billboards all over the city, but he was R. Kelly's first attorney. He was Blagojevich's first attorney, and he's my childhood friend. I've known him since I was six. And so he uh, actually gave me a home when I first quit the public defender's office to actually practice out of his office. So he's known me forever, but he's seen me and worked with me and brainstormed cases with me. And this is what he has to say about me and that I'm just mentoring and developing um, attorneys. I also teach attorneys. I forgot to mention that throughout Chicago, the Chicago land area. And now he sees I'm getting creative and teaching teens much the same information. I also was a law professor. But um, this is another friend of mine, Dr. Royan Hendricks, right before the pandemic, she actually flew me down to Texas in order to do a youth summit. So she got to see how quickly I engaged and built rapport with the kids, how I used the game that I mentioned as a teaching tool um, in order to supplement the information that I give the kids about their power and leadership. And then this is also a friend of mine. This is Lynn Watkins Ayasabi. She's also an attorney and she invited me out to her teen group to speak to them. And the great thing there was there were parents and teens present. And so the parents, they had a lot of aha, eye-opening moments as I was telling their kids, yeah, mama can't save you. You gotta ask for an attorney. Uh, mom can be sitting right next to you or they can appoint a youth officer. And so she said that, you know, she was impressed about how quickly I built rapport with them and how her teens and parents both left enlightened. So my question to you is what if all Wolf Warrior did was help your son or daughter stay calm during a tense police stop? give your daughter the courage to walk away from friends who are about to break the law. I talk a lot about a group group accountability. People don't know that they could just be the lookout or the driver or play a very small role with a group of people and go to jail for whatever the major crime was, especially if a weapon was used. What if you can improve your son's communication skills to avoid conflict altogether and instill the confidence in him or her to believe that they can control the conversation? Uh, the outcome of every situation, what would that be worth? So what I tell people is I have two solutions. One, the program that I just told you about, if you're interested in that, I'll tell you how to learn more. But at the very least, I would say get the game. So the game has two worlds, the world of possibilities, where you graduate high school, you uh, go to medical school, you buy a puppy, you buy a house. And along the way, there are red squares, which are flashing lights, which is police contact. Maybe you get stopped because your city sticker is out and you get a warning and sent on your way. Or maybe your car matches the, ve matches the description for a vehicle that was used in the drive-by shooting. You don't know until you draw the car. There are 54 different real life scenarios that I've personally seen in, seen in court and a couple are from the media. And then if you draw a card that gets you arrested, you actually land in the world of trouble, which is jail and court and not being able to bond out or you bond out and then uh, your court your case gets delayed because your attorney doesn't have the videotape or they can't find the witness, the ups and downs that you see in the court system, the frustrations. And then the goal is to get back on track and beat your friends to triumph. And so the amazing thing about the game is kids actually put down their devices. They take their heads out of their, their cell phones. They actually talk to one another and engage with one another. And they forget adults are in the room. So they have very honest conversations. So I hear stuff like, oh, wow, I did this last night and didn't get caught. Or, oh, wow, I didn't know this is why my cousin was in jail. I never understood why she was in jail, but now I understand. 
So I gave you guys a discount. You get $5 off if you enter the code ADOPT. If you go to the uh, website, justicejunkie.store, J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E dot store. And then the last part is I will drop in the chat where you can book a call with me if you're interested in the program that I mentioned to you and just empowering your kid and learning more. So I'll go ahead and drop that. And with that, I am done and I came in under time, Michelle. So <laughs> I have my handy timer on the side. So I would say at the very least, get the game. And for those of you with younger kids, what one woman suggested to me, I had a grandmother contact me. She said that she is white, her grandchild is biracial, and it's three. She said, I'm buying the game. I will dumb the cards down and read them to her as she gets older as stories. And she says, because I am terrified for my, my granddaughter and I want to start now. She said, I don't want to wait till she turns 13. I don't want to wait 10 more years. I want to have this as an ongoing conversation. So a lot of people are fearful about, well, I don't want my kid to be scared of police. I'm not telling you to make your, care, your kids scared of police. I'm saying the next time you get pulled over for a traffic ticket, have a conversation. I'm telling you the next time you send your kid off with his, his or her friends, tell them about, hey, if one of you gets in trouble, that means all of you gets in, get in trouble. Like there are ways to dumb this down, to make it really simple for eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds, and then stop saying things like, oh, just tell the truth. Yes, that worked when you were six and you stuck your hand in the cookie jar and you got caught. It does not work. And you can tell them this, and what does not work when you're 16? It does not work anymore, whether it's a theft, whether it's a violent crime, whether it's playing a very small role in another um, with a group of people, it does not work. And you have to start teaching your kids to walk away from the group. If the group is up to no good, and a lot of these things happen like that. It's, we see the back, we see the kid from school who we don't like. We decide it'll be funny to jump him. When we jump him, his iPhone falls out of his pocket. We think it'll be funny to grab the iPhone. We all take off running, but before we do, we hit him two times with a stick. Guess what? That's an armed robbery. So you need to start, and I spell that out in the cards. And so that's an armed robbery because you took something from the person with force and you used the weapon. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if you were the one with the stick, if you were the one with the iPhone, it doesn't matter if you were the one who kicked him or laughed, or if you were the one who videotaped him with your phone. So I represent the young lady on the Facebook four case who the four black kids who were accused of kidnapping the white kid. It's not like that at all. I actually saw her today, <laughs> but um, she was a videographer and she was looking at 60 years in prison. And so you need to start teaching your kids now that playing a very small role in a very bad act will land them in a lot of trouble. So if, because it's an intimate group, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to field those. But remember, you can get the game, go to my site and type in um, adopt at the um, checkout and you'll get $5 off the board game. Do you have a picture of the game? Uh, I don't, I did back there, let me see, I do. You can just send it to me offline. Okay, but well, here's the actual game. Okay. And I can show you what the board looks like. <clears throat> so here's the board. I know there's a little bit of a glare. But here are the two worlds. This is the world of possibilities where all the great things happen to you and then your computer dies and your car breaks down. But along the way, there are flashing lights um, spaces. If you land on this flashing light space, you draw a flashing lights card. And then you can end up over here with officer unfriendly in jail and you're desperately trying to get out of jail. And here are the cars, there are 54, but I just rolled out an expansion pack of 25 more. So this is great. Kids love, they call the stories. So they love reading the stories. They want, this is the type of game that you have to twist your kid's arm to play. But once they play it, they don't want to stop playing they want to see what's going to happen next. They want to laugh and joke about who's going to get to the end first. They want to laugh and joke like, oh my goodness, you did, you know, this thing and you're going to jail. And, but they also get the sense of loss. They say, man, I just graduated medical school. I got married. I bought a house and now I'm in jail. I lost all of that. They get that. They get that. And it's, it's very disturbing for them. And then they want to gain it back by beating their friends to the end. 
I think one of the most uh, important points you pointed out is they need to walk away when their friends are up to no good. And kids have a hard time doing that. And that yeah. we, we as parents of younger kids can start drilling that into our kids. Yeah. So that's second nature by the time they become teenagers. That it's just like, yep, I know, I got to go. Bye. Well, I, my goal is to teach kids to be leaders. And mm -hmm. so they, they sway the whole crowd. Oh, that's better. That they don't have to yeah. walk away by themselves. That we're not doing this, period. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to happen. <laughs> and then the, you know, the troublemaker becomes the lone wolf. Everybody else leaves them standing there. Any other questions? This was immensely uh, thought provoking for me. So I appreciate it. Right. How old is, is your child or are your children, Renee? Uh, yeah, I have two kids, uh, eight-year-old son. And, oh, no, sorry, not eight. He's nine. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> a nine-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter. Okay. Um, and it's hard, you know, in sitting here and listening to these scenarios, you know, immediately my, my, my mom brain says, my kid would never, right? My kid would never be in that situation. I, I can't even imagine him being in that situation. Even if I am, um, even if I think with my whole heart that he'll never be in that kind of a situation, um, at the very least, I want him to be able to be the person that is most knowledgeable, right, in his group of friends. So, you know, even if I'm, you know, delusional <laughs> about, you know, whether or not my kid is ever going to be in a terrible situation, at a minimum, I want him to be well educated about all of this, right? So that, um, so that he can be a voice of reason, right? Or knowledge, um, or that leader in the group, as you mentioned earlier. And a lot of times kids just, they really do get caught up. They're writing, but think of this. Think about, when I don't know how it was when you were a teenager, but when I was a teenager, I was always in a car with a bunch of people. And we would just grab this person, that person, and this person's friend who I'm meeting for the first time is in the car with us, and we're going to the party, or we're going to the barbecue. And if the cops stopped us, and that person who I don't know who hopped in the back seat of my car had a gun, had drugs, had whatever, it's up to the discretion of the cop to decide who those who those get attributed to. Will they be mine as a driver because it was my car? Will the cop decide to split it up and say any, mini, mighty, mo? Any one of you could get charged with it? Will he say the oldest one is stuck with it? So it's important for kids who even will never get into trouble. You don't know who their friends are affiliated with and how they would all end up in one situation. I get stopped. I get all the time told by clients, I didn't know this other person with us. I didn't know their name. I only know their nickname. I only met them once. I only saw them that night. You know, I never met them before. And now you're in a big mess with these other people who you don't really know. Yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> I, I got to say, aside from all the arrests and the statistics, the number of people who get stopped of color is astronomical and gross. So that comply but don't consent is a big thing. Uh, a big lesson that everybody should learn before that they have to be put on the spot to comply, but not their safety and, and well-being. Well, that and I was under the assumption as well, right, that like they can't talk to my child without me present or, you know, that like I am some sort of shield <laughs> for my kid. Um, I, I, I definitely was, um, uh, I didn't understand that piece of it, so. We represent a family now. We were on the news last week where it was a four-year-old child who a police officer dragged out of a CPS classroom and dragged them down the hallway. Four. For what? We don't know for what, because the mother wasn't even told. She didn't even find out until months later. Probably a kid who had some type of um, behavioral disability and the school didn't feel like they could control it. I see it a lot amongst the population that I work with. And if they've had a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma in the household, anything that uh, contributes to the ACE score, adverse childhood ex uh, experiences, 
that sometimes these kids have behavioral issues and the school can't handle it and so they call the cops now or the cop is right in the school and so that's how they handle it and you see these on the news all the time they're cuffing six-year-olds and so you got to prepare your child for that to be in a situation where they're alone with the cop. Mm -hmm. There may not be a principal there. there the t teacher may not be in there with them. There may not be any other kids in the room. And they have to know what to do or say or not to say anything. Any other questions? You know, I have a, a sort of a question, although I don't know if it's possible to answer. Like I was just picturing what you were saying about somebody being stopped and, you know, hands up because the, the police officer is concerned about their safety and you want to make sure they think they're safe. They feel safe. You're not going to cause anybody any, you know, to be more violent with you than you have to. But what happens if like somebody's being beat up in an elevator or, so, or being beat up at a stop or like, how do you protect yourself or how do you, how would you counsel your clients to protect themselves without escalating violence or cover your face like some of the stuff i teach i'm telling you joel tell you i don't i don't sugarcoat anything so <laughs> cover your face absolutely do not touch that cop do not hit them back i teach four rules don't run don't reach don't resist don't run your mouth and if you are in a position where the cop is out of control and you are the most reasonable person in the room and they're still acting out, all you can do is protect your face. I would not touch a cop because you'll end up getting charged with all kinds of things <laughs> just because you were protecting. And yes, you are allowed by law to protect yourself from excessive force from a cop, but the excessive force is supposed to be determined by the judge. So I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't be like this. <laughs> just don't kick me in my teeth. Um, other than that, you know, so many things. I tell my clients, don't battle on the corners, battle in the courtroom. So, you know, yelling out, I know my rights, you can't do this to me, or trying to argue the facts of the case. Don't do any of that on the corner and don't physically fight with a cop, even if the arrest is bogus. That makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Should our, if our kids, should ever get arrested which would never happen but if our kids should ever get arrested should they be telling the truth to their lawyers oh please yes <laughs> <laughs> i just yes. want to clarify yes yes, the, yes the lesson is really it's who you tell the truth to not uh not to tell the truth and don't lie mm -hmm. so a lot of kids what they'll do is when they talk to cops they'll lie to get themselves out of the situation. Adults are the worst at this. <laughs> but what the problem is, you don't know what the cop knows. <laughs> so you're lying, I didn't do that, I wasn't there. They've got you on videotape. They've talked to four people before they talk to you. So don't lie and make it worse for yourself. Don't create a false alibi. Don't do any of those things. <laughs> Just be quiet, no matter how bad it is. Tell your attorney, but don't tell anybody else. And don't talk about it on the telephone. Like when they call their parents, they shouldn't talk about it on the telephone because the no. telephone conversation is probably being recorded. Is that correct? Well, one, in Cook County, you're very unlikely to get a phone call at all, which is a fight that we have right now, at least in the city of Chicago. But two, remember, they're going to confiscate your phone. They're going to inventory your phone. So you're probably on a pay phone or some sort of landline. And they're going to be people around you. <laughs> so it won't be a private conversation. Like, I don't even, they have little um, meeting rooms at the police station for attorneys and clients. I tell my clients there, don't tell me anything in this room. Because I don't know if it's, I don't know who's listening at the door. The attorney I showed you in there, he actually was in a position, he's talking to his client. It was recorded. The state's attorney turned over the tapes to him showing him that the cops recorded him in a confidential conversation with his client. So I don't trust this. Just don't talk until we're in a position to have a, you know, a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. I mean, if you're injured or something like that, you need to tell me that right away. But other than that, save it for when we can have a private conversation. <clears throat> well, I hope I will never need your services in, in that way. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's really helpful though. And if people are interested in the game, do you, do you have like a website too? Is that your website? Yeah, I'll put that in the link too. And you guys get a discount just for being on this call. So I'm giving you $5 off. It's $40, but I'm giving you $5 off. <clears throat> you need to share with other too. There it is. So it's all, they're both in the chat. Oh, thank you, April. Appreciate you coming out tonight and uh presenting and definitely i'm gonna want a copy of the recording because i think we could get it out there okay well thanks so much for having me thanks okay. april great job thank you thank bye. you bye bye renee bye brandy